Xavier, thanks for coming on the Cash Flow Pod today. Uh, I, you know, I'm really excited to dive into your past. You've got like some really interesting companies that you've built over the years, uh, all the way back to the dot com era. And uh, you know, there's obviously like a lot of exciting stuff in the AI space, which you're currently working in. So we can kind of talk about where the market's going and where technology's going. Uh, I can just kind of kick it off. I think you know we can start with Presto here, which is your your current company, your CEO of Presto. You guys have a uh, like if you anybody's ever eaten at Applebee's or Chili's, if you use the tablet at the table side to add something to your order or close out your tab, that's your company that powers that whole uh, technology infrastructure. You're also building like a new uh, iteration of the company, which is your Presto voice platform to literally have AI powered order taking at drive throughs So, you know, customers can interact mm -hmm. with uh, automation, you know, order taking, uh, you know, simulating a real human so like really exciting stuff in the ai space i'd love to just kind of like dive into that and then we can you know see where the conversation goes today yeah thanks for having me brian good to be here awesome so yeah tell me more about presto like what are you guys uh what are you guys working on did i get the the sort of like intro summary did i hit the the right points on that Yes, yes, you did. You did. Yeah, so we're, um, you know, we're a restaurant automation uh, company. So we're, uh, we've been in business for 15 years. Uh, we started uh, Presto at the MIT. Our co-founder uh, was a, an MIT graduate and he uh, had, you know, an idea for how to basically use tablets uh, at the restaurant to take orders and automate the process of, you know, adding, like you said, adding items to the order and so on, and also paying for, for the tab. And the company grew, um, you know, over the years, uh, we built a device that's called Presto Touch that's, you know, sits at the, at the, at the table. Uh, and uh, you know, we've been through a few, you know, um, upgrades of that product over the years. Uh, and it's still uh, a very important product for us. And the other product that we're really uh, excited about is our, a voice AI technology. It's called Presto Voice, and that powers uh, order taking at the drive-through. So, the typical use case would be a um, you know you're in a drive-through, you drive through uh, to the speaker post, and you start ordering you know your burger and your fries and whatever, speaking to actually Presto Voice, which is uh, yeah, powered by AI. And so that product is uh, high growth. There's a lot of potential. It's a real life application of AI. Uh, there's 130,000 drive-throughs in the United States, and very few of them actually use this type of technology. So we're at the very beginning of something really big. We're excited about that opportunity, and that's really what's um, I think what uh, is carrying the company for you know now and for years to come. Yeah, that's awesome. There's like you know obviously AI has so much hype these days. So I see like all these use cases on Twitter and just everyone building. AI powered products. And, you know, it's like a lot of times it's just kind of like buzzwords, but, uh, you know, like the product ideas, I don't think are always great, but like, this is a really interesting use case. Like when you have like a really like vertical specific niche use case that actually makes immediate sense to a business, to a business's bottom line or to their efficiency mm -hmm. metrics, like that's really interesting stuff. I think like AI is sort of a platform shift, uh, you know, almost like how mobile, mobile devices, like, you know, when, mobile devices yeah. came on the scene. It's like a fundamental platform shift for how users can interact with businesses and, you know, utilize technology in their everyday life. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, you've been following all the, you know, the recent uh, announcements from OpenAI and, and the, you know, all the buzz around, you know, AI in general, it's really taking off, right? But I think like a, a lot of, uh, a lot of times when you have new technology like this, a lot of people are looking for problems to solve with that technology. And, and so there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there thinking about, you know, what we could do, you know, with this uh, technology, with large language models and so on. And, and Presto actually is in a unique position because we, we actually have a problem that can be solved today with that technology. And that's exciting, uh, you know, that the market is growing and it's going to be a big market and, and, and AI is a perfect for what we're trying to do in the restaurant, which is automate, again, automate uh, the restaurant. So yeah, we're excited about it. Yeah, and it's like, it's awesome customer experience too. Like if you really nail that like real human interaction, so it's like they don't even know they're talking to an AI, 
uh, it's, you mm-hmm. know, it's a great customer experience because then you can sort of like get rid of that line. Everyone, you know, has been to Chick-fil-A and seen like the 50 car deep line that's like, you that's know, right. s- strapped around the corner. So if you can reduce that and like get more cars through faster and sort of like get, you know, and then I guess it goes into like kitchen efficiency metrics at that point so they can get the food out faster. But, you know, if you can sort of like streamline that pipeline it you know there's probably so many people that drive by they see that line and they're like yeah screw this i'm not i'm not going to sit in that line and then they just keep driving to the next place yeah totally and that's the i think one of the core uh components of the value prop which is consistency right so you you're more consistent um in like getting cars through through the speaker post and through the ordering process you're more consistent also ordering and upsetting, uh, and, and that is reflected in, you know, an improvement in speed of service, uh, the average check size uh, goes up, and, and also the people at the restaurant, they are uh, more available to do other things in the restaurant, right? So whereas in the past, you would have someone uh, with the headset and listening and, and actually taking the order while they were doing other things in the kitchen, like, you know, making a burrito or, or preparing an order, now you know they they are uh, you know monitoring what the AI is doing and doing other things that are important and then intervening because that happens too right intervening and overriding the AI when you know an, an order is too complex or when you know there's too much noise in the restaurant for for the AI to pick up the exact order and so on so we're we're helping you know the operators in the restaurants as well do things that are maybe higher value than, than taking the order. Taking it's orders. kind of funny though. Like you, you, it's, it's an interesting use case. Like you have people monitoring what the AI is doing. Uh, like I'm sure the AI mm-hmm. is probably doing a pretty strong job though. Like you, we have AI like driving Waymo and cruise cars around San Francisco. And I, I don't know if any, I don't know if there's like a command center monitoring the cars or not, but it's like, you know, we literally have like vehicles self-driving today. And uh, it seems like, Seems like that's probably a harder problem to solve than like taking a, a food order. It's the same type of problem in some ways because of you know the you know we're you're trying to learn from the human and actually replicate what a human would do. And it's also similar in the way that you know your example actually is a good one. You know, in the uh, automotive space, you know these self-driving cars, right? You still need to have a driver kind of monitor what the AI is doing and take over. When uh, when the AI is not responding properly, which is one of our principles as well. So our solution has multiple AI components that allow, uh, you know, the 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 sound, the the what the the guest is saying, to be translated into text, and that text gets processed by an NLU. But all of that is also in the presence of a human um, on the Presto side. We call those people the voice agents, human in the loop, so to speak. And these people at Presto are responsible for making sure that the order is accurate and providing like the highest level of accuracy uh, in in order taking. And, you know, these people are essential because, you know, the AI currently, uh, if you apply the pure AI algorithm to a problem like this, you wouldn't achieve a level of accuracy sufficient for this product to be viable in the restaurant. So what we do is with, you know, these, what we call again, human in the loop, is a common technique in AI. Uh, these people would, uh, you know, using AI themselves, be able to take orders, correct orders, or just let the AI do its thing and and, and take the order on behalf of of the restaurant. So it's kind so of like a lot of tuning, parallels. Right? Yeah, so so it's a bit more complex than that. In that, you know, the 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 data that is collecting through these interactions between our voice agents and the AI in order to, you know, take the orders is also used to actually teach the AI and make the AI more effective over time. Uh, Like in a lot of, you know, these uh, AI uh, driven products, there's a step that is basically the teaching process, right? So you're, you're trying to, um, you know, solve a problem, specific problem with AI. And what you have to do is you have to actually teach the AI over time to be more and more effective and rely less and less on the human and more and more on the AI, which is, you know, what's happening in the self-driving uh, cars, happens in a lot of other AI applications that are enterprise applications, right? Enterprise applications. 
Dude, so I'm not I'm not familiar with this. Maybe you know more. Uh, does Waymo and Cruise do they have the human in the loop in like a third, you know, a, a decentralized or whatever, like a you know, offsite location where they're monitoring these vehicles and able to take control of them if needed, or is that? Uh, do you know about that? No. Uh, so I, I was referring more to the notion that, you know, if you take self-driving cars and the autopilot, right, you still have to have a, a person at, you know, the steering wheel for, you know, basically just to monitor what what the autopilot is doing, right? And that that is what I'm alluding to is that, you know, the when the stakes are high, like, you know, you have your family in your car and you're in your test line, you're turning on the autopilot, you, you know, you, you don't want... Uh, you know, you, you cannot completely give control of everything to the uh, to the autopilot, right? You should have to have a human controlling and making sure that indeed, you know, the, the car is not doing something it shouldn't be doing, right? And that that assistance by 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 a human is core to a lot of these applications that you see, whether it's a human in the car at the steering wheel, or it's someone more like Presto, where we have to actually have a staff of people who are uh, monitoring the orders and sometimes taking the orders, sometimes correcting the orders, making sure the orders are correct. Whether it's that or what we do, it's the same principle, which is the AI needs to learn from humans and the AI and the humans collectively together uh, are able to deliver a high level, highly accurate product or, or a result for, for our customers. Yep. Have you have have you seen uh, the Waymo and Cruise cars though? And in, in SF, they have like full like, yeah. driverless. No, see them like, all the time. Yeah, there's just no. Yeah, no yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I see them all the time, and I, I see them also on you know Highway 280, which connects San Francisco and San Jose. And I'm you know I I'm noticing I've been you know watching these cars for cars for the last fifteen years. I'm noticing that the cameras are getting smaller and smaller right i still think that uh i still think that they're too big i mean you know <laughs> you, you know you know what i mean right so these like yeah, they have these antennas and all kinds of stuff on the roof that you know it's very very you know easily you can tell that they're they're still you know in development and still improving the tech so i'm i'm waiting for uh i think this is part of like Elon Musk's strategy is to, you know, make these cars like these Tesla Model 3s and whatever comes next, like really cheap, get them down to like 20, 30 K. And then yeah. they have all these little tiny cameras and sensors built in. And then he just flips the switch and like m marks a deal with Uber or, you know, Lyft or whatever, and just, you know, turns these things on. And that that's like the new uh, that's like the new way to get around. Yeah, yeah, I've been waiting for that for a, a few years. I mean, he started talking about it uh, honestly like ten years ago, uh, maybe maybe not ten, but you know, seven eight years ago. And I always felt like we were a year away from that uh, <laughs> happening, and it's like still not there, still not there, still not there. But I think we're getting closer and closer, and that's an exciting future because I think that uh, you know the the it, when it gets to transportation, I don't know if you. You know, you have you know kids or you have family members, but you know you. I'm, I'm always driving my kids around, right? Or my wife is driving the kids around, right? You know, wouldn't it be nice, you know, to basically say, all right, we have a car that doesn't require a driver. You put your kid in the car and safely takes the kid to soccer practice or whatever, right? I mean, the the implications of that are are gigantic um, and definitely, uh, it's definitely like uh, a real value. Um, it's not just cool; it's actually valuable and, and solves solves a real a real problem i want to take a quick break from the episode and say if you're enjoying this content the best way you can say thank you is to subscribe so if you're on youtube hit the subscribe button and the notification bell and if you're on one of the podcast platforms hit the subscribe button there as well and also share it out to your friends and colleagues if you find this content useful and you think other people will enjoy it as well please send it out and back to the episode yeah, I mean, that's like the convenience and lifestyle factor. I don't know if you listen to the All In podcast, but they were just talking about this a couple episodes ago that like, I think the three leading causes of death in the United States are automotive related. So there's like, drunk mm -hmm. driving, there's distracted driving, there's no seatbelt. So like the three leading causes, it's like 100,000, I don't remember the exact number, but it's like 100,000 deaths per year or something like that. It's yeah, right. associated yeah. with these yeah. vehicle uh, accidents. And it's like, if you can get that down to, you know, like these these self-driving cars are like way more accurate 
and uh, like safe, I think in theory, like through the tests that have been done so far, they're, they're, you know, supposedly way more safe, like maybe 1% of the casualties of, you know, hum human operated vehicles. So it's like, if you can, you know, save like 99,000 lives a year, that's a, a pretty incredible uh, outcome. But uh, I guess we'll see like, yeah, how it goes. Yep, yeah, totally. So uh, cool. All right, let's uh, let's move on. So uh, you know, I, I was looking into your background. Your first company, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Fireclick. What's that? Fireclick. Right. Fire yeah, Fireclick. You yep. started that in 1998. So that was like a. Uh, enterprise SaaS platform for e-commerce clients at the time. So those e-com clients That's back right. in like 98, 99, 2000, they were getting these like ridiculous valuations. Like I'm thinking of pets.com and all these companies that were, you know, like, you know, it was like funny money floating around back then. Uh, yeah. And then uh, it crashed like really hard in 2001 with the dot-com bubble. Uh, but you kept building that company until 2006. So I'm, I'm really curious. I think you uh, exited it though in 2004. So I'm curious, like, what was that time like, you know, selling an enterprise SaaS platform to e-commerce and just having, you know, like the rug pulled out? What was like the, I'm sure it was like hockey stick growth and then just like waterfall, you know, uh, numbers during yeah. the dot-com bubble. So I'm curious, like what that time was like. Yeah, so it was a very different, uh, you know, special uh, time in our history, I think. You know, so I, the, the reason why I came, I actually built that, the story behind the company was that uh, I came to the United States in 1998 uh, to get a master's degree at Stanford uh, in electrical engineering, and I come from Europe, so it, you know the you know the the whole thing about startups and California and you know the dot com boom and all of that was kind of a, almost like a cultural shock uh, when I when I you know came to to Stanford in 1998. But very quickly, um, you know, the, the I was you know very inspired to start my own company on campus at Stanford, and I actually didn't spend too much time studying, to be honest, and spent most of my time at Stanford connecting with people and meeting with VCs and angel investors, and you know, like running them through ideas and getting feedback and so on. And it's an unbelievable environment for that. Um, so I remember that, you know, during my first quarter at Stanford, I was, you know, like taking double E classes and working on quantum physics and that kind of stuff, had this idea, went through the process of actually getting it funded. Uh, and, you know, the, the image that I, I remember from those years was we had a first term sheet from an angel investor uh, for like 25K, uh, something like that. And we're like super, super happy. But the angel investor, we, you know, was saying, well, that's not enough. You need to raise a million. And so we show up uh, like the uh, you know, next day uh, to Wilson's and Cini for a meeting that was about like raising money. And all of a sudden, you know, we ride our bikes with my my co-founder from Stanford. We go from like the campus to this place, Page Mill Road. We, you know, drop our bikes and, and essentially uh, get into this meeting with like 12 angel investors and former CEO of this company and former executive at Microsoft and former, you know, it's like very impressive, right? We give our pitch and by the end of the meeting, everybody raised their hands, say, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. We raise the first million dollars and then we you know, start the business pitch? like that. Yeah, it was my first pitch actually to, <laughs> to an audience. A real I've literally audience. never heard uh, a story like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was, it was. Crazy times. So anyway, so we then we uh, keep working on technology. I continued uh, my classes, although it wasn't very focused on the on on the classes, to be honest. And then we built that company with you know more VC funding and 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 really it was a super rapid growth for the first I would say year year and a half. Uh, you mentioned Pets.com. That was one of our clients. Um, you know, we had Webvan as a customer. We were building uh, solutions for uh, e-commerce sites to make the e-commerce sites faster. So one of the issues back then was that we were in this transition between dial-up and DSL and cable. And so some websites were still uh, too slow uh, because some people were using, were using dial-up, right? So we had very cool technology to accelerate websites. And we, like I said, we like very quickly got a lot of customers 
of course, they weren't paying much money. And the second issue was that in year 2000, 2001, uh, these dot coms started going out of business. So we peaked at, you know, in 2001, uh, we had about 100 employees, 200, 300 clients. And all of a sudden, from that peak, we had like maybe a third of the customers uh, that went out of business right away. And then the other third were very unhealthy. And only about a third of them were like these big established companies that had deep pockets to, to continue working with us. But the bottom line is that we were at this peak and then we had to do a layoff, you know, from 100 people down to 19 people. I remember the number. That was an, a horrible time because, you know, the, the, you know, I never had done a layoff before. I never had, you know, to tell people, you know, sorry, but this is not going to work out. We need to part ways. Uh, and it was it was scary also because uh, all of a sudden we had like you know five engineers left right how we're gonna build the product how we're gonna continue to um, to grow the business and so on how old were and you things then? actually worked out uh, 23 24 years wow. old Threatened so that was fire. a factor too that's right that was a factor as well although I didn't know back then that it was a factor but now I understand why. Uh, you know, when you're young and inexperienced, it can be a can be a kind of a problem. Um, but yeah, so that that happened, and then you know we pivoted to another space and we built a product in a kind of same core technology, but applied to a, a different vertical. Uh, and we regrew, and eventually we were able to um, merge and sell the company to a much bigger company that was um, a public company. And you know, I was that was a good. A good outcome, but it was a real roller coaster for you know five six years, and uh, luckily with a happy ending. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's a really good story. I I I can't even believe that your first pitch you raised a million dollars. That's just like absolutely that's right. Yeah, I guess it was probably a combination yeah. of like you really had something figured out, and like I guess they must have really saw something in you guys. Plus, like the the time, the market period of just like everything getting funded, it must have been like a combination of those two things. But uh, yeah, in retrospect, I think I think back then everybody was uh, like looking for ways to make money, and you had mm -hmm. these like three Stanford guys uh, with a cool idea. Let's you know why not try, right? Uh, and I, I think those you know that type of environment. Uh, you know, it's, it's a one once in a lifetime type of environment. It's definitely not the norm, and I don't think we'll ever see that again. So, but I kind you know, of saw it, it a little it, bit in in twenty twenty one. There was like sort of a little bit of right. a, a glimpse of that dot com era come back, and then you know, same thing happened. Like the valuations got cut by eighty percent across mm -hmm. the board on on like you know growth stage SaaS after the the bust in twenty two. But yeah, I'm yeah, sure it wasn't it, anywhere near, you know, I wasn't on the scene in, in the dot-com period, but uh, I'm sure it wasn't anywhere near like the magnitude of the dot-com era. Well, it definitely felt like a bubble, uh, in, in, you know, as, you know, you know, you, you, you may, you remember the, it wasn't that long ago, right? So we went from, from like, you know, big, 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 uh, I was going to say like, downturn with COVID. It didn't last long, but there was a time when COVID hit that we thought, oh, you know, maybe the economy is going to tank, right? And then it rebounded and then this, you know, surge of optimism uh, lasted for about a year. It was like um, four weeks so of, it, like, uh, of like uncertainty yeah. during COVID. Then it was like, everything's getting That's funded. Right. <laughs> everything's getting funded. Everybody's working from home. Everybody can build the company in their like garage. and uh, But it didn't last long. Uh, you know the dot com, uh, the the boom, and uh, it lasted three or four years uh, because really it started in late nineties and went all the way to 2000, uh, 2000, 2001. So that one felt longer and more irrational than this last one. But yeah, I I do I I, I agree that there's some parallels though. So interesting. So. Uh... When so you, you kind of touched on one of the other things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, so I didn't go to college. I you know I'm like totally self taught mm -hmm. and just kind of bootstrapped uh, entrepreneur my whole life, uh, my whole professional life. Uh, been in like the tech space for you know like 14, 15 years now. Uh, so 
you know, I, I basically started this right out of high school, but there's a lot of people that are like super uh, like pro, you know, computer side degree, you know, comm sci, like, you know, academic. Uh, and then there's like you know, a lot of people that are outspokenly against it. Like I'm thinking of Peter Thiel and the Thiel Fellowship, <laughs> where he literally pays kids to drop out and do their startup. Uh, I don't I don't even think he takes equity. I'm not sure. But I think he just pays kids to drop out of Stanford and and do uh, do their startup. Uh, I'm curious, like what you, you know, you just kind of started to tell me about your Stanford journey where you kind of went, got your, you know, got, got your startup funded. And then you were just kind of like pretty much focused on the startup and not on, on school. I'm like, I'm curious about your experience, uh, going to Stanford. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend it? You know, the tuitions now are like 60, 80 K, uh, it's like getting pricey. So it's like, <laughs> I'm curious about like this whole higher ed, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, future and, uh, also what, what your general thoughts are on that. Yeah. So I, I, I disagree with Peter Thiel. Uh, I think that, you know, the, uh, if, I mean, it's not for everybody. And, and I, I don't think that any, everybody who goes to college will necessarily, uh, feel like they've really, um, made a good investment and the four years were really worth it. I think for me, the, when I, when I got to Stanford, I already had a degree in math uh, undergrad from you know from from Europe from France, right? So I already had that um, that background. I think where it helps is in the discipline of thinking about problems. So I did not study computer science that much as an undergrad, um, only the last you know couple of years. And at Stanford, I actually did not study computer science. I was a double E major. Uh, but I think the 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 rigor um, in your thinking and like the um, also the the pursuit of excellence, right? And, and trying to to push the boundary a little bit more and think about issues is really helpful. Now, I will tell you that in my career, I I've met a lot of brilliant people that do not go to college, and usually those. Uh, you know, those profiles, I'm thinking about one in particular, it's like, it's probably true that putting this person thinking about through college would have been a bad idea because highly creative person, um, you know, hears about a new language, will, you know, automatically go online and try to, to learn the language and start playing with it, right? That's another way of basically of learning and actually becoming a, you know, a, an amazing professional that doesn't involve college. So I, I, I don't want to say that you know college is for everybody and, and and that you know it's you have to go to college necessarily. The thing I don't like about Peter Thiel is like this notion that uh, you know you're in college already, you're you know Stanford or whatever. Don't finish your degree, uh, go do a go do a startup. I think that that I, in my opinion is kind of a it's kind of a, a shame uh, because you know if you're there. You might as well, you know, take advantage of those four years, you know, learn uh, a few skills and then meet people and then, you know, get in this ecosystem and this mindset of being entrepreneurial or or, or building a skill set for for your future career. I, I you know, that's that's my personal view on it. Yeah, it's interesting. It's I I can see that argument. Uh, I can also see the argument that it's like if Peter Thiel selected you for the Thiel Fellowship, that's like. You know that alone on a resume might be you know equal or greater to a degree at, you know in comm sci or whatever uh but yeah it's an interesting like perspective i do think there's uh you know there's certain degrees like you know uh computer science uh mbas like certain certain degrees that are still uh like petrochemical engineering like these doctor you know get you know becoming a medical doctor that you know these degrees are still like extremely valuable and well, you know, if you build a, you know, build your your career strategically, will lead to a, you know, financial, financially successful outcome. Uh, but I, I do think there's like so many degrees these days where you know students are paying you know forty, fifty, sixty k tuitions, and there's just no way they're going to recover it. Like, imagine if you, I think you said you did electrical engineering, but you're also doing some physics degrees. Like, imagine if you like finished with a physics degree. And, uh, right. you know, that's pretty much like, that's like a path for, uh, you know, um, ac that's an academia path, like you're going to stay in academia, yes. or, you know, you, you kind of become like a professor, or you, 
work in a lab and, you know, I don't know what the salaries are, but they're not going to, you know, it, it, you're going to be carrying that debt load for a while. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. So, I, you know, I have one of my uh, sons actually is going through college right now and he's a computer science major. So I completely relate to that. And I'm encouraging him to actually uh, like go deep and deeper than than just learning computer science, right? And that's also one of the appeals. But you're right in saying that, you know, if, if he had chosen uh, a you know, another discipline there and um, without a real, without, without being able to really connect that to a, 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 um, a career where he can make money and be successful, it would have been a lot harder for me to, to talk about education in those terms. Uh, it, it, I, I think I, I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And some kids, like, I think they know what they want to do, but I think most don't uh, at that age. That's right. <laughs> so it's like they either get pressure from their parents and go down a certain path or they just, you know, take a guess. And I think that's how we end up with like these underwater basket weaving degrees and, you know, stuff yeah. that's not commercially applicable. That's right. Yeah, uh, totally cool. agree. All right. Did you did you make a lot of good connections at Stanford? I know that's like what everyone touts, like go to Stanford, go to MIT, go to Harvard, because you're going to like rub shoulders with all these, you know, like really high profile people that are going to be doing big things in the future. And did you have that experience there? So I, so I did meet a few very, uh, I mean, the sons and the daughters of very famous people uh, at Stanford. Uh, I didn't keep in touch with those people. I stayed in touch with, you know, like uh, uh, my friends basically at Stanford and, you know, it's, it's really fun because I mean, like anybody, right? So in the first few years, you know, there's you, you, kind of this group grows together and nothing really happens. And all of a sudden after like 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden one guy is like this very famous researcher and this other guy or, 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 or uh, the, this woman is all of a sudden the CEO of a company. And that's, that's fun, fun to watch, but it's a very slow evolution, right? Uh, over time. And then uh, like, 15 year, you know, it's a slow evolution. And then all of a sudden, boom, you see them popping up. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoy uh, that part of, you know, the college experience. You stay in touch with people. And when you see them again after five years, it feels like, you know, you've, you've been with them yesterday and forever, right? The connection is immediately there. Uh, and uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Well, changing gears. So we talked about FireClick. We talked about Presto. So FireClick was your first company that you started in Stanford and raised a million dollars on your first pitch, which is awesome. Uh, Presto is the company you're building now, which is the uh, drive-through automation technology and the tablet at the rest, the tablet at the table in restaurants. Uh, you had another company. Uh, it was Live Clicker in the mid 2000s. It looked like you had about a 10 year run on that and then exited. Uh, and that was like a uh, that was like an e email marketing platform that had like dynamic, uh, you know, emails where you could sort of like embed video or dynamic elements or something like that. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So th that company was was a uh, departure from the traditional Silicon Valley model. In that, you know, the after my first two companies, which were VC backed, um, you know, this company was bootstrapped. So uh, I kind of got, got burnt out. Uh, pitching all these investors and these angels, and I wanted to do something different and build a company, you know, the good old way, right? So you build a little product prototype, you get clients, uh, a few initial clients, they pay you some money. With that money, you invest in invest in the business again and try to build the business organically. Uh, and that was a high bar. Uh, you know, the company was actually started in two thousand and eight. And I don't know if you remember, but in 2008, <laughs> it was a pretty scary time back then. Uh, we didn't know if we would have an economy. Uh, At least you started the, it after um, the crash, not not right before. <laughs> well, no, that's right. So, but it's still very, very scary. Um, but that was that was um, a super awesome experience of going back to the basics of building a business. Uh, so we started in the mm -hmm. video commerce space. So YouTube, you know, was just getting started back then. 
and social media was was taking off as well. And our original idea uh, with my co-founder was to build a software platform that would enable e-commerce websites to put videos on their product pages and allow you know the you know those e-commerce sites to pitch products right using video. So that was the the, the initial uh, idea. We did relatively well for the first three or four years, and then we hit a plateau. The plateau lasted forever, I would say two to three years. And then we connected our technology to another space and we pivoted to actually be building a, a real-time content personalization solution for, for email marketing. So in the emails that you get, most of the content you know, is usually static, right? So you get a bunch of images and text, and you know, that that's a in that space is actually very mature now. You have uh, many companies doing that, including Clavio, which you mentioned, or Exact Target, or uh, Salesforce, and so on. Well, the content in those emails can be dynamic. You can have video content, or you can have personalized offers for you, or even things that are more dynamic in nature uh, about your past purchases and so on. And so, our company, LifeClicker, was actually building those content blocks and making it easy for email marketers to leverage that type of content. And that, you know, that pivot that we did all of a sudden changed the trajectory of the business. And we started getting customers much more easily. Everything went up and to the right. We started making you know, more money for customers and attracting many, many more companies to do that. And that was, that was a very good success and proved uh, that there's still room for companies that are bootstrapped and built organically as opposed to you know, VC backed or angel backed. And that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah. And that, that actually. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, and, and so that, that experience was 10 years, right? So it was the longest of all my companies. And ironically, it was the one that I started without funding uh, and the most successful of all. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a feel good type of experience. Are you, uh, so, uh, if, if you were going to build another company from scratch now, would you bootstrap it again or would you uh, fund it with VC? Totally, totally depend on on the type of company, right? So if it's a if it if you can see a path where um, you're you're able to build the first prototype, you're able to convince a few people to pay you a bit of money, um, and buy your product, be your early partners, and you see a path for organically growing that business, I would definitely avoid the VC route because uh, first of all, it, it will stay your company and you'll have control of your destiny. Um, and that's a that's a good thing. Uh, but also because it's highly dilutive, you know, to go and raise money. Uh, and, you know, in the end, a lot of people building companies are looking for an outcome and the outcome is less if you have uh, more VC money, right? More runs of funding. Um, yeah, but but there's there's room for uh, for VCs, of course. I mean, it depends on the scope of the project. Sometimes you have to build a very complex product before uh, it can add value, and that's expensive, right? And so, you know, a company like Presto, for example, is is a good example of a company that needs capital because of all the things that are involved in making our drive-through solution work. It's it's a very complex product with a lot of components. There's a lot of engineering. There's AI technology that needs to be built. That's a very difficult company to start as a bootstrap company. Um, but you know, VCs, you know, love these type of companies, and investors love these type of companies because you can see clearly see that with investment, you know, you're opening up an opportunity that's gigantic and a highly you know, high growth space and so on. So there's, it really depends on 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 the type of idea that you have and and what you see, uh, you can do without any outside investment. Um, and and both both are completely viable ways of building building a company. Is there one of is there one like the VC backed like hyper growth uh, hyperscaler model versus like the bootstrap kind of like slow and steady compounding like is there one of those that's like a more attractive model to you personally and like the the lifestyle you want to live or is it just uh, kind of like whatever like if you get 
if you get like your head around an idea that you really want to do, then it's just like the idea is more important than you'll do whatever's like right to execute that idea. So if you ask me that question when I was a Stanford student, I would tell you 100% VC, VC uh, uh, all the way because you're also getting paid, right, in, in uh, along the way and, and you have a bit more financial uh, freedom when you go the VC route. But to, to be honest with you, I, I personally believe that it, it, you get more satisfaction out of building a company from zero with no capital and only with you know your the power of your ideas your you know your, the the good engineering you put into your product the good discipline you put in execution that's that's so much more rewarding it feels like the vc world to me feels a little bit like almost it's it's an advantage you're giving yourself right so you're you know you're at the end of this process you're going to be more satisfied if you like built something from scratch with no outside help basically right so and it's kind yeah, of like, that's you know, like job a little bit too. Like if you, if you're a VC, you know, backed company, like that needs to be 110% of your focus. You're probably not going to be doing like any other businesses. You're not going to be probably doing too much investing or, you know, as well. Like, it's kind of like, that's like your focus, I guess now there's like secondary rounds. So it's getting a little bit different than how it has been historically where like founders are taking money off the table earlier, but, uh, Generally speaking, I think it's like more sort of like, you know, I, I've never personally had a firsthand experience with having a VC backed company as a founder, but uh, mm -hmm. it's definitely to me feels like a little bit more like having a job because you kind of have a boss at that point. Yeah, although, um, so when I did my bootstrap company, I, you know, that discipline that you learn um, from, you know, like starting a company with VC backing that discipline you learn in terms of execution processes and doing the right things at the right time uh is super helpful for your bootstrap company so um i, I never viewed you know my bootstrap companies as side gig uh, gigs right I always viewed them as okay this is what i want to do and i want to do this thing this one thing and i want to do it right i i personally do not have the mental capacity to like being like in three companies at the same time and so for me, it's, it, it was not, it, it's not the freedom of doing something else that's attractive to me. It's more like the freedom of like working on something I really love doing and having the, the, the full control over, over the trajectory of the business, right? So I'll give you a precise example. Uh, so there was one time at, at LifeClicker where, you know, we were, we started on this like video commerce product and, you know, we were, at a plateau and we were looking for ways to branch out. And the, I know what that conversation would have been like with the VC. The VC would have said, no, you're not gonna pivot. I invested in this original idea. I need to persist. And if it doesn't work, you need to shut down this business. When you're, when it's your company, you're, 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 you're not gonna accept that, right? So you're gonna be like, okay, uh, let's build another prototype in another market and see how we can leverage this technology. And you're going to be investing time and energy into something that is not the core of your business, but you do it because, you know, you, uh, you want to, you want to pivot or you want to get to a bigger market and, 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 you know, ultimately, you know, build a bigger company. The, what you're doing is inefficient in some ways and a VC would not accept that. So, there's a lot of freedom that you gain as far as running the company and finding the right path by by being in control of your of your destiny, um, and, and that that's what I enjoy the most. So at LifeClicker, we built over 20 products. Eventually, 18 of them were uh, completely. Uh, I mean, we killed them. It didn't make sense to continue, and we converged on two of them. But thinking about the 18 experiments along the way that led to one very good outcome which was this very, very good product uh, that was successful in the end. So I've read, uh, I've read a lot about Jeff Bezos. He, he's like an interesting uh, entrepreneur to me. I've like listened to a lot of podcast breakdowns, like acquired uh, podcast, the ACQ guys uh, do a really great job. They have a four hour episode on Amazon Marketplace, which takes you to 2008. And then they have a two or three hour episode on AWS, which picks up at 2008 and takes you to present day. 
And uh, so it's like seven hours of like getting inside the brain of Jeff Bezos. Uh, and like the one like theme I keep seeing from Amazon and like the mindset of Jeff Bezos is that it's a brute force idea machine. So basically they create ideas at rapid scale and they brute force the ideas into the marketplace and then they quickly kill or invest in ideas. And it's all about like, you know, a 10% chance of a hundred X return. You know, if you see, if you can like project a 10% chance of a hundred X return, invest in that with like, you know, ferocity, you know, uh, like ferociously invest in that, in that uh, angle. If you don't see a 10% chance of at least a hundred X return, kill it, move on, just keep like brute forcing ideas. And, uh, and that, that was like their whole business strategy. They had some interesting stuff too. Like I, there's this concept of, uh, like most companies are trying to get like, as they scale, they get less efficient because you have more people and like more relationships. And then the company becomes mm -hmm. less operationally efficient. So most companies try to solve that by like communicating more. And Jeff Bezos, solution was actually, no, the solution is communicate less. So let's not have any meetings, like only the absolute necessary meetings. Otherwise we don't have meetings. And the way that we communicate across organizations is we create APIs for everything. And if you want to interact with this other department, then you just read their API docs and interact through their API. Otherwise, like you don't like have a meeting about how to work together. You just use the APIs. And uh, so like those principles, like I think those two things are like what made Amazon what it is. And uh, so like yeah. that concept of like you said, 18 ideas to get the one, like brute forcing the market. I love that, like brute force the market approach. Yeah, and, and so you know, I was my comment to that was that you know he started with a very strong foundation, right? So he had like obviously a very good business with Amazon.com, and so he had a bit of freedom to do these things. I think what's difficult is that not everybody's an Amazon, right? So when you're on your own, uh, or you have your your co-founders and three or four other people with you, uh, it, it, like everything has a cost, so like you're you're starting with one idea you're trying to make it work you're trying to get the customers you're trying to you know have the right product and so on it's very difficult it takes a lot of courage to actually say well you know what guys we're still going to dedicate 20% of our time to this new idea because you know if this doesn't work at least we have a path forward and and we get to keep looking right and usually it takes a very strong personality to actually like push the 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 company in that direction, and and it's uh, it's not it's not easy. It's not easy to um you know to make decisions like that. You mentioned the APIs. Everything is an API. I, I wonder how that would work at a normal company like Presto, right? Uh, I, I wonder how I could have applied that to my prior company. So uh, you know, it, it's I, I admire I admire that type of thinking. I wonder how applicable it is to to the rest of us, right? To uh, to the rest of the humans. Here. I mean, that's like that. That is the question. Like, uh, you know, I, I study a lot of these like really successful entrepreneurs and just kind of like listen to their stories. But it's like how much of those stories carry through and apply to today, and how much right. of those stories like cross industries. And so it is like really interesting. Like you you can build up all this like history and knowledge of of the past and like how much of that is true wisdom versus you know step by step like uh action plan versus just like cool information to know yeah yeah and it has to do also you don't forget you know the uh, personality of the founder right um and i say this because i've been i've been a co-founder or founder four times in my career but i've also worked with other people, other CEOs, other co-founders, right? And you can clearly can see that some of the co-founders I work with were like high energy, like um, very outspoken, highly communicative, and so on. And then you have other people who uh, do not possess, you know, those uh, those qualities, and they're more uh, like quiet and 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 maybe more cerebral, but they're just as effective. The thing is you can't quite apply, you know, some of the, you know, success tactics that one entrepreneur would have easily to another entrepreneur because some of these things cannot be fake, right? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know Jeff Bezos at a personal level, but I'm, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to know 
like what type of person is he on a one-on-one -on -one situation, right? Or, you know, is he warm? Is he cold? Is he like high energy? Is he medium energy? Is he cerebral? And then you can start to understand if those ideas make sense for you because you're you're different. And, and so you have to, I think, filter out some of that, you know, and, and apply what what is applicable to you, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just one one closing note on the live clicker. So uh, that's an interesting business model. We kind of briefly touched on Clavio. Clavio just IPO'd. Uh, Andrew Balecki, I think is how you say his last name, uh, was the founder. And uh, I think he owned like 40 or 50% of it when it IPO'd. So he still had like a pretty sizable chunk. Uh, IPO'd at a $9 billion valuation with like $450 million in ARR. So it hit like a 20x multiple, which is pretty crazy right now. Like we were seeing 20, 30x multiples, you know, a couple of years ago, but uh, at a growth stage company IPOing to still hit, you know, like that's a pretty high comp compared to what the other publicly traded SaaS companies are doing, which is really interesting. Like that tells me that space, like you were in that that email marketing space, the live clicker uh, mm -hmm. business model, like you, you were pretty early to it. Like it's still got a lot of like headroom in that industry. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting space. Uh, and it's like e-commerce, e I think is like the best, the best uh, use case for, for email marketing, like marketing automation and yeah. segmentation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So back, back when I was actually at Stanford in 1998, it was a, uh, a first company that I heard of called Sentmail that was in this, you know, like back then it was automating the processing of email. It was kind of, Nebulous. And uh, I remember thinking back then there's no possible business there. It's just no way that anybody is going to make money. And then, and then, you know, in the early 2000s, of course, you had like email marketing took off in a big way. And then people started saying, when, with social media, email marketing is dead. Nothing's going to happen. This is like a, 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 it's a dead end. Uh, you know, Twitter is going to re Facebook and Twitter and all these platforms are going to replace email, and they didn't. And you know, to 2015, 2016, same thing. You know, it was like you know this whole thing with Snapchat and all these new ways of, commu of communicating. Again, email is dead. Email is dead. And so we are here, like 20 years later, and there's this company out of nowhere uh, with very good product, very good execution, very simple product, and they're like almost half a billion dollar run rate, crazy valuation. And it's proving that, you know, it's very difficult to predict the trajectory of any market or any business. And I, I actually love watching these guys being successful. There's another uh, company, MailChimp, that went through a similar process. They were and like that bootstrap too, key. man. That's bootstrap. And it shows you good engineering, good product, honest uh uh, honest marketing, very simple. Like they stick to some very uh, core principles, and uh, and it shows you that you don't necessarily need hundreds of million do of dollars in funding. You can actually do it in a purely bootstrap way. So yeah, kudos to them. Hey man, this it's been an awesome episode. Uh, we got into so many cool topics. I just, I'm excited for this one to come out. Uh, Xavier, where can people find you if there's anywhere, like anything you want to plug? Uh, is there any like social channels you want to, uh, you know, uh, plug for yourself? Yeah, so presto.com, uh, presto.com is the domain name. That's for our our website. And then uh, we're on Twitter with presto underscore AI is our, our handle. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time, Brian. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah.